My name is Bill Marston. I'm the Division Chief of Vascular Surgery at University of North Carolina, and I'm also the Medical Director of the Wound Healing Limb Salvage Center there. And we're going to really go through kind of the whole range of treatments that we use in our clinic and that are validated for treatment of venous leg ulcers. This symposium is uh, sponsored by the SAWC and NACCME, and is supported by an educational grant from Organogenesis. And these are the objectives, really going to look at the, you know, the epidemiology of venous ulcers, the etiology, and then really spend most of the time looking at therapies from pharmacology to compression to adjuvant therapies, and then uh, surgical and endovascular techniques to treat these patients as well. So this is my favorite quote on venous ulcers from Michael Hume back in 1992. And uh, in the 90s, there really wasn't that much research going on in, in this area. But uh, really, since that time, there's been a tremendous amount of work done. And uh, we know a lot more about venous ulcers, what causes them, and, and I think how to treat them than we used to. So they're very common. Um, if you look at chronic venous insufficiency, everything from spider veins to varicosities to edema and then to ulceration, it's, it's very common. About 7 million people are estimated to have this, and it's uh, increasing quite significantly. Worldwide prevalence of venous ulcers, uh, as many as 1%, and we think in some parts of the country it, it comprises 80 to 90% of leg ulcers particularly if you don't live in the diabetes belt, and about one to one and a half million new cases per year. So it's a very common thing, and you know, I'm sure all of your clinics, uh, like mine, are, are full of them. Uh, it's very financially intensive as well. This is a pretty old estimate, probably from about 2005, 2006, of two billion per year, and uh, now estimates are more in the three to four billion per year uh, cost-wise. Uh, this is one of the really key studies about the clinical impact from Tanya Phillips, and uh, she showed that contrary to popular belief, there's a lot of pain and suffering that these leg ulcers impact on their patients. So 65% of her patients in their questionnaire study said severe pain, so this was high-level pain, and most uh, people thought it wouldn't be that frequent. 81% had mobility that was severely affected. And I think that, that two-thirds of these patients really said their financial situation and just their, their whole well-being was profoundly affected by the venous ulcer. So clearly it's critical for us to heal these things as rapidly as possible to return these patients to their quality of life. Um, so, you know, what is a venous ulcer? How do, you, how do you diagnose it? You know, these are the things you look for. It's the location. It's the thickened lipodermatosclerotic skin, typically down around the ankle and just above, hyperpigmentation, absence of hair, thickened nails, edema, those things are all things that go into that diagnostic space. What are the associated comorbidities? These are all risk factors associated with thromboembolism, venous thrombosis, and things that then go on to cause the patient to get post-thrombotic syndrome and ulceration. So age, previous surgery, particularly orthopedic surgery, trauma, malignancy, history of venous thrombosis, hypercoagulable states. There's some feeling that we ought to test these patients if they have a history of DVT and an ulcer uh, for the common hypercoagulable states. Family history, oral contraceptives, and the rest as listed. So how do we manage these patients? And you know, here's a typical patient in my clinic. 37-year-old male, severe edema. You can see how the wound is. You know it's going to be draining a lot. Patient had a history of DVT about five years ago. It's not a rapid pathway from DVT to ulceration, typically years, even decades uh, between the two. Uh, patient had had two prior ulcers in the same location that had been healed and then recurred. And the question is, do we need to diagnose that that wound, I mean, you look at that, you say, well, it's probably a venous ulcer. I know I'm going to get rid of edema and treat the wound, and it's probably going to heal. So there's a controversy that exists throughout the country, which is, do I need to diagnose this correctly as a venous ulcer by doing studies that look at the veins? Some people say, well, if it's just going to heal with compression and managing the wound, it's a waste of time and money. And this is what you do if you want to really diagnose venous disease, is to do a good multi-component venous ultrasound examination. 
And this is not the kind of thing where you send the patient like you do in the hospital and say, is there a DVT? Because you'll get a report back that says no DVT. And that doesn't tell you whether or not there's venous dysfunction. So really you need to stand the patient up and look at the veins in that functional position and see if there's reflux. And the technicians are really critical to this effort. People everywhere say, you know, well, there's no one in my area that does this type of diagnostic imaging. And the answer is there is somebody in almost every town in this country that's interested in taking care of vein problems. I go to the phlebology meetings, the vein world, and they say, well, there's no one in my town that can manage a wound. So we got to get everybody together, you know, and, and put these, uh, these pathways together. So this is what you look for on ultrasound, and this is uh, reflux, and essentially, so this is, you compress the leg and you see forward flow through the vein, and then you release compression, and that's going to cause blood to drop down towards the foot. And this is a normal tracing where you don't see much flow after you release, versus this where you see profound high-velocity reflux going the wrong direction in the vein. And that's identifying that segment of the vein as the problem. And we can map out all the different segments to find out where the problems are. So this is one of our studies, and you know, any phlebologist or, or vein specialist does these type of studies. And in this case, we found that the patient only had reflux in the saphenous vein at two locations. So you've got gross reflux running all the way down the saphenous vein. We can do a 30-minute procedure and close that vein and get rid of their venous hypertension. And we'll talk about whether or not that's, uh, you know, how that affects ulcer healing. So the results confirm or minimize the importance of venous disease. If you find no problem with the veins, then you should look for other causes. I mean, this patient may have, you know, not venous disease. It might be lymphedema, in which case there are other treatments for lymphedema. It might be something totally different, like vasculitis. And if you treat a patient with vasculitis with a venous pathway, you're not going to be very successful. So the Wound Healing Society guidelines also, it's really critical to make sure they have good arterial supply. So about 20% of our patients with venous disease and ulceration also have arterial insufficiency. What happens if you start to compress a leg that doesn't have good blood supply? You got problems, you know. And if your, your staff is good and they recognize when the patient says, you know, that really hurts, and, you know, they start to think about it and they, you know, check the, the arteries out. But if they don't, the patient can get tissue necrosis around the, the ankle and, you know, cause real problems. So if you don't feel good pulses, go ahead and get arterial studies to, uh, to document adequacy of supply. Now, what is the etiology? What is it about venous problems that lead to ulceration? So the problems in the veins can either be reflux, like we talked about, or obstruction. If the veins are blocked and the blood can't get out of the leg, it's going to swell and eventually ulcerate. So it could be either reflux or obstruction. And if you measure the pressure in a vein in the ankle, which we used to do back in the, as you can see, this study's from 93. Uh, we don't really do that in the lab anymore. You don't want to uh, be sticking needles in lipodermatosclerotic skin. But if you measure the pressure, once it gets up to 50, 60, 70 millimeters of mercury, you have a high incidence of ulceration. So this is venous hypertension, which is the underlying cause. What is it about hypertension that causes ulceration? We know some, we don't know everything, but it looks like what happens is the RBCs and some of the white blood cells leak through the capillary uh, junctions that are distended, and that causes an inflammatory response in the tissue. And this is sort of a low-grade recurrent inflammation that occurs over years of time and eventually the skin becomes thickened, scarred, and is uh, prone to ulceration with minimal trauma. And there's a number of uh, uh, research uh, studies out that have talked about MMPs and cytokines and things like that. We did one of these uh, projects at our uh, institution where we took tissue biopsies from venous leg ulcers before and after four weeks of compression. So our goal was to figure out we know that compression leads to healing in the majority of patients, and what, so what's it doing to the milieu in the wound bed? And what we found is that if you looked at patients before, this was healthy skin, we took a, also a biopsy up in the thigh, and you measure almost no MMP, no protease in normal skin. In the wound, it's upregulated, and after four weeks of compression, it drops down pretty significantly. 
And it's very similar for inflammatory cytokines like uh, IL-1, TNF-alpha, same thing, normal tissue, very little, upregulated in the active, uncompressed wound. And then this resolution of inflammation with compression is also associated with healing. So the underlying thing when you're looking at that patient in the clinic, they have venous insufficiency and ulceration. It's an inflammatory wound. So the, the idea is to get rid of that source of inflammation, and there's two main ways to do it. Well, you could, you know, hang them from the ceiling in those, uh, you know, gravity boots, but, you know, you can't do that 24 hours a day. So you can compress, or you can get rid of the venous problem by correcting it. So our protocol in the, in the clinic basically centers on these steps. Compression, wound debridement, elimination of bacteria, exudate control, and that's your initial start. And then you measure your progress. And if your progress is really robust, you know, it's really, you know, healing up nicely, that's probably all you need to do. But if you're not seeing rapid progress and the patient isn't on that pathway where they're going to heal in eight to 12 weeks or something like that, then we look at adjuvant therapies to accelerate the process. And then the key really, other than healing the wound, is preventing the recurrence. So many of our patients have recurrence. If we just heal the wound, give them a compression stocking and send them out the door and never see them again, we're really not doing them, you know, proper service. So compression, standard of care, every guideline out there, Cochrane Review, they all agree that compression is beneficial in healing ulcers. It reduces edema, improves the efficiency of the calf muscle pump at ejecting blood, protects the skin, promotes healing. And if you look at the, the literature, high strength compression and sustained compression are better than lower strength and non-sustained. But how you get there, there's a lot of different ways to do it. And you know, these are all options. Um, and for different patients, they may be the right choice. So I don't think you can just say, well, we compress all legs with X, you know, or, or, or strategy Y. Because for one patient, we may use a multi-layer elastic compression system, but we've got the other patient who's got a small wound and wants to work and doesn't want to smell and, you know, a better strategy for him is a primary dressing and a good compression stocking. So I think you need to look at all these different options and, uh, and select what's best for your patients. Inelastic compression is a good uh, modality for people who are ambulatory because it's, it doesn't give. So when they walk, it supports the calf muscle pump and really ejects blood out of the, the leg. And so they get a lower resting pressure. So in theory, you can have less complications with good inelastic compression. Um, but you can generally get there with, with either modality. And if you look at the literature, it's really impressive how um, any of those methods done well, you get about the same result. So if you look at these studies and the results, they're all in this same kind of 60 to 70 percent healed at somewhere between 16 and 24 weeks. And none of them had any real difference except for this uh, one study with four layer versus short stretch. So you're going to basically get about two thirds of your patients to heal. And you can tell, you all know, you look at the leg when you go in there, whether it's going to be easy or hard. You know, number one is the patient going to be compliant, of course. But if you see a leg like this, Generally, you know, that's going to do pretty well. The skin looks good around it. It's got some inflammation. If you get rid of that in the edema, you know, here's a month later. Obviously, that, that wound's doing great. You don't need to do anything more than good compression uh, and management of the exudate. And then that wound's going to heal in two or three months. You compare that to this leg. This patient's had 25 years of recurrent ulcerations. You know, that skin is just so inactive. You could go in and excise all that skin. I mean, that would be a, you know, surgery to get all of this stuff out of there and put some big flap on. But most of these patients, they're not going to let you do that. So this was five months later. And it took about a year to heal that wound entirely. And, uh, and then I think she did come back about a year later with another wound. So the goals are just to get rid of edema. So however you can get there to eliminate the edema from the leg, whichever modality you can use, uh, that's the way to go. And if you look at some of the, the pros and cons of the different systems, this uh, chart uh, provides some of those and uh, sort of the things we've said already, so I won't go through it in detail. Now debridement, there's a lot of controversy over when, how often, 
what's the best method, and uh, we're going through a process right now to update the Wound Healing Society guidelines for venous ulcers, so I've just reviewed all the literature on debridement for venous ulcers. And it doesn't provide much in the way of answers except to say that debridement overall is beneficial, but we can't tell you any more than that. So let me show you a couple studies here. We all know the potential benefits and all that, so I'm going to skip through a little of this. And here is a, a really well-done study from Keith Harding's group, and they basically looked at the effect of debridement using the curette method on recalcitrant venous ulcers. So these are wounds that they were treating that hadn't been progressing very well. And in some of them, they debrided them, and others they didn't. And basically what they found was that the ones that they didn't debride, not surprisingly, continued not to heal. Whereas those that they did, there were some of them that started to reduce the, the ulcer size on average. So this was evidence that in that recalcitrant group, uh, some patients will begin to respond to debridement. Now, Matt Cardinal um, looked at some of the clinical trials, the published clinical trials, and uh, looked at uh, uh, 366 venous ulcers and 310 diabetic foot ulcers, looking at after the wound was debrided, what was the change in wound size over the next week. And so when you get pretty robust numbers like this that are well studied in a clinical trial, you can get this kind of data. Uh, as we all know, clinical trials aren't necessarily real world you know, it's not, they're pretty well-selected patients, but it's a pretty good process to study this question. And what they found was that in the week after debridement, there was a greater wound size reduction if debridement was performed than if it wasn't. Also, centers where VLUs were debrided more often had higher rates of closure. Now, obviously, is that because they debrided or is it because they educated better, did better compression? We don't know. Anyway, some admittedly very cir circumstantial evidence um, but a key point was that the frequency of debridement didn't correlate with the rate of wound closure. So I think if you go and you say, well, I'm going to debride them every week, no matter what the wound looks like, you're probably not helping the patient. You might be helping your, uh, your uh, financial situation, but not the patient. And the new guidelines that the American Venus Forum uh, is coming out with is said, obviously, that wounds should receive debridement at their initial evaluation to remove what doesn't look good. If the wound looks fine and you think it's healthy, good tissue, you probably don't need to debreed it. Maintenance debridement may be required, so it's use your judgment. Use your judgment. Don't just you know, routinely debreed every week regardless. And obviously we want to take the wound from you know, looking like this one here to something that looks really nice and happy and ready to get some skin on it. So what sort of pharmacology can we use or any you know drugs that are going to heal these wounds for us in the states we're somewhat limited there there are a couple of agents that are available in Europe that we don't have access to uh, that may provide some benefit none of these are you know a panacea there they may provide a slight benefit uh, nothing huge in this uh, country you can get horse chestnut seed extract no information or evidence that that heals wounds but there is evidence pretty decent evidence that it reduces pain and swelling in people with venous insufficiency. So we tend to use it in our earlier stage venous patients, and some of them uh, feel better taking that. Pentoxifiline or Trental was developed as an agent for claudication, and it increases red blood cell deformability, and it had some modest benefit in claudicants with arterial insufficiency. It was subsequently studied in uh, five randomized trials looking at venous leg ulcers, and the largest of these was done by Vince Falanga, and um, they found a significant uh, decrease in time to healing in patients taking pentoxifiline. Um, the downside of it is there's a fair uh, incidence of GI side effects, but we do use this routinely in our patients, um, and about 20 to 30 percent of them can't tolerate it. So what about dressings? I mean. If you all have been in the exhibit hall yesterday, you're probably as overwhelmed as I am with the selection and range of things you can choose to put on wounds. And uh, some of them are very creatively named and whatnot. So is there any evidence that one dressing is better than another? And the answer is nothing in the literature says this is the best thing to put on a venous ulcer. So what we do is we say, what's the goal of the primary dressing? And, and everything under your compression. For us, it's to get that wound fluid off of the wound surface. 
You know, I told you that the, the wound and the fluid is full of these inflammatory cytokines and proteases. What does the protease do? It chews up collagen. So if it's sitting on your wound, you know, it's probably going to inhibit new cell growth into the wound. So we use highly absorptive dressings that are going to wick moisture away. As you're squeezing that leg and reducing edema, you're going to have heavy drainage. So you've got to change them pretty frequently, particularly in a leg like this one, until you get that under control. Now what about bacteria? This is another area of great controversy and another one that I reviewed the literature for the guidelines. And you can really not make any firm guidelines in the area of uh, wound bacteria. And the problem is there's just not good studies on wounds other than clearly infected wounds. Uh, there's one that I'll show you in just a minute. But other than that, it's pretty much a wasteland of quality research. Um, so clearly when we see a wound like this, you know that's not healthy. It's not going to heal well unless you can get that wound bed in better shape. And there are a lot of options. Debridement, getting rid of the exudate usually helps the wound start to granulate. Uh, you can use topical antimicrobials, systemics. And we all worry about these biofilm infections. The problem with a biofilm is it's hard to diagnose. You know, you can't really do a test that says, well, there's bacteria and they're in this type of biofilm and this is what you do about it. There are some strategies now that are, that are emerging where you can get PCR-based diagnostics. Uh, we need more evidence on how that affects the actual healing of wounds uh, and may be a good strategy. So right now, what you want to do is get rid of this stuff. You know, it's slough, it's whatever, it harbors bacteria, it's going to inhibit healing. And you can do a lot with good debridement. These are wounds that, yes, I would debride it if I saw it like this. You know, you want to get that stuff off as best you can. And if they can't tolerate it from pain, these would be wounds that we would uh, do a debridement under anesthesia. Now, this is data from our clinic. And, um, you know, these are wounds that didn't look infected. They may sort of look like those wounds I showed you. And they weren't responding to compression for six months of time. So we did cultures. These were biopsy cultures. And we found 48% uh, of them had resistant staph species, and about a quarter of them had pseudomonas. And most of those patients had various topical antimicrobials used on them frequently. Um, so we think that, you know, with these kind of older wounds that have these biofilms, that you really need systemic antibiotics uh, to get rid of them. The problem is you treat them for what? You know, nobody really knows, maybe two, three weeks. The wound starts to look better, it starts to improve. You don't want to keep them on antibiotics, so you stop it. The stuff can repopulate pretty quickly. So it's sort of a battle to get that wound to improve and heal before this stuff returns. What about topicals? You know, what, are the, what does the research say? Is there any evidence that they're going to, you know, uh, inhibit formation of these films, inhibit infections, or improve healing? And the best study out there, and admittedly this doesn't answer all the questions, but it was called the Vulcan trial, done in the UK. And what they looked at was these were ulcers that didn't look infected, uh, but the question was should we use silver dressings on them or not? So they're randomized to routine silver donating dressings versus non, and they all received multilayer compression in the other standards of care. They basically found no difference in outcome of anything they measured. Quality of life, healing, nothing. So you shouldn't routinely use a topical antimicrobial, but this doesn't answer the question that if you are following a wound, it's doing well, and then it starts to stop healing, you're seeing more what you think is bacteria on the surface, maybe you culture it, would a, a topical antimicrobial help then? We don't know. Would it help it start healing again? We don't know. So the question then is, you're doing all this, we call this sort of the standard you know, therapy, I don't like to say basic because it's not easy. It requires a lot of, you know, intuition and really paying attention to the wounds, measuring progress, and really jumping on them when they stop healing. So what should you do, uh, you know, if, if that process isn't working? And we see patients all the time where, you know, we, they come in and we say, well, how long have you had that wound? They said, well, a, a little over a year. And they've been at a wound clinic for maybe six or eight months, and they've been putting Una boots on it every week. And, and every week and every week. And the thing is, you've got to realize if you're doing that for four or five or six or eight weeks and they're not healing, you've got to reevaluate and do something different. 
So uh, Matt Cardinal also uh, published this study, and basically what they found is that if the ulcer uh, you know, doesn't heal by about somewhere around 30 to 50 percent in a month's time, they're not going to heal in another eight weeks of doing that with the same plan. Very few of them are going to respond if you continue that compression and don't look for something different. So what do you do? Well, we just reevaluate. We start over. We say, well, we may have missed something. There may be arterial insufficiency. Probably it's a good time to do a biopsy. Could there be vasculitis? You know, rarely it could be a margillans. You know, you don't want to miss those. So if you have a non-responding wound and you don't have a good reason, it's a good time to do a biopsy. Also a culture if you haven't done that. And then you assess. Maybe it's just that you think they're getting good compression, but they're not. If they're doing their own short stretch at home or a, or a compression stocking, it, you know, change the mode. Put them in a multi-layer. You know, then maybe you know they're going to get the, the dose of compression that they need. If they're in multi-layer, you know, maybe are they taking it off before they come back to clinic? Who knows? Try and figure that out. And then that's really where to think about adjuvant therapies. If, it, if there's not some other etiology and it is a venous ulcer, what are the things that you can do that will accelerate the healing process? So first, skin grafting. Skin grafting probably has a, a place in the management of VLUs, but you can't really define it from the literature. And the problem is that some of the wounds will heal, and then some of them will re-ulcerate right through the, the skin graft. And patients aren't very happy, you know, if that's the process. So um, I think most of us don't do a lot of skin grafting except for really big wounds. If you can, you know, cut the you know, big wound down by 50% in size, that's probably a benefit. It's going to make the wound easier to manage. But um, I'd say it's a pretty rare case that I do skin grafting these days. So what about living human dermal uh, tissues? And the only one approved by the FDA for venous ulcers is Aplograph. And um, how many of y'all used Aplograph? So probably half to two-thirds. So it's a bilayer living human skin equivalent, and it's sourced from neonatal foreskin. It has dermal fibroblasts as well as epidermal layer with keratinocytes. And it's in the living construct, and it's created to, to be similar to skin. So if you look at it histologically, you know, it has the same structure essentially with the absence of sweat glands or hair follicles. Um, and the idea is that this would, uh, would be beneficial to stimulate healing in the wound bed. We talked about cytokines, growth factors. If you look at what's in Aplograph, it's very similar to what keratinocytes and human fibroblasts express. And so it's a robust group of you know, FGF, all these growth factors, as well as some of these cytokines. And we, we think one of the real effects of this is to reduce inflammation. Here's the method of application, straightforward. You want the wound to be well prepared. If you put any, you know, any product, really, but particularly this, on a wound that's not well debrided, that doesn't have good control of bacteria, that doesn't have control of the edema and the exudate, you know, you're wasting the patient's time and everybody's money. So do all of the things we talked about before. And once you get that wound you know, ready, it, like you would skin graft it, that's the time to do uh, consider Aplograph. And actually, in our clinic, I would say, we don't always culture the wounds, but we generally do to be sure that there's not some, you know, even lower level of some bacteria present there because we feel like we get better results if we eliminate that entirely. So very few products in this field have multi-center prospective randomized level data that's done for the FDA. Audited data, you can't really monkey around with these results. It's, you know, it's, it's got to be at a high level. So this was studied in 240 patients uh, for FDA approval. And ulcers were all present for greater than a month, averaged just over three applications per patient. And this was study compared to standard compression, which was done in both groups. And so the only difference was the study group got Aplograph. So 40% healed in the control group versus 57% in the Aplograph group. And that was significant at the 0.02 level. If you looked at some of the subgroups, I think really the, the most interesting thing to me, if you looked at those really hard to heal wounds, ulcer duration greater than a year, you know, there's a real profound difference, 19% control versus 47% healed with the Aplograph. So for those wounds that are stalled, you know, 
there's something, you know, they need something. We really think this probably provides a shot of growth factor and protein that, that helps them move on towards healing. The cells don't persist, so this is not a skin graft. Um, in biopsy studies, you look a month later, very few can you still identify any cellular uh, tissue or DNA there. So don't think of this as a graft. It's a uh, living cellular application that can work with the wound, uh, but after somewhere between probably a week and a month, it's no longer there. So reapplication is a worthwhile strategy. And as I said, it was about three applications per patient in the clinical trial. <clears throat> now, a different product, different category is Oasis. It's not living cellular, but it's a dermal wound matrix. Um, it's from uh, submucosa of sheep intestine. And basically, it does contain some protein, some collagen, glycosaminoglycans, and maybe some growth factors as well. And this is lyophilized and then prepared. It's a straightforward application, as is Aplograph. And again, you've you got to do both these products with compression and uh, everything else. There's one paper uh, from Cook Biotech that did find active fibroblast growth factor in Oasis. So there may be some expression, but probably not a broad range of growth factors in this product. It was studied in a prospective study, um, 120 patients. Uh, not for FDA approval, but to document benefit and a similar standard of care, debridement, compression, and then randomized to uh, SIS or OASIS uh, or standard of care. And basically the results were 55% healed SIS, 34% standard, so it was a significant difference. Now there's tons of treatments out there that have been uh, evaluated in case series looking at whether they'll assist venous leg ulcers, including these. Uh, intermittent pneumatic compression, ultrasound, electromagnetics, not really any evidence that hyperbaric oxygen is beneficial for venous ulcers. So I think that's really a waste of money. Um, for your standard venous ulcer also, it's not really any evidence that negative pressure is helpful. Um, it, it is used in some cases, but I don't think it's a, a strong reason to do that. So what other things are important? You get the wound healed up, and then how do we prevent recurrence? So this is our data in our clinic. I think we do a pretty good job of educating people, hopefully, and yet we still have a quarter of them back in one year with another ulcer, and 50% of them eventually come back with another wound. Those that come back with one tend to have multiple recurrences over time. And if you think about it, you know, if you go to your patient and you say, well, here's what, this is the state of the art. We're going to heal two-thirds of you in three to six months, and then you got a one in four chance you'll be back in a year. They'd probably say, well, Doc, I mean, can't you do better than that? I mean, there's got to be something else out there. And um, so the, qu the thing is, is that in the long run, you know, healing the wound is good for the patient's quality of life, but it's probably better to correct the underlying problem if you can. And there are methods to do this, including endovenous ablation, perforator treatments, venous stenting, and I'm just briefly going to review these for you. In our clinic, this is our distribution of reflux when we do the studies that I mentioned, the, the Doppler studies. About 40% of the patients have deep venous insufficiency, but in all the other patients, they've got some saphenous or perforator insufficiency. This group, about a third, you can correct that with a basic low-risk procedure, about a third of patients. Now, another third, you might be able to improve it, maybe not correct it. And then some of these patients have venous obstruction that we can now do stenting procedures. This is an endovenous ablation with a radiofrequency device. Very straightforward. You percutaneously access the vein. So all they have is just a, a needle stick for the procedure. And you put the device up at the saphenofemoral junction, turn on the radiofrequency device, heats the vein up, takes about 10 minutes to pull this back, and it closes the vein about 97% success rate. The other emerging problem is called May Thurner syndrome. So May Thurner, May and Thurner, in the 50s defined this problem where the iliac artery compresses the vein. It crosses the left iliac vein right where the spine is behind the vein. And because of the pulsations of the artery, this vein becomes diseased over time also can happen at other crossing points, down lower and even on the right side. 
So it can be either side that patients get this problem. And what you see is when you do a venogram, this is an injection in the iliac vein. The vein is blocked here, and the blood has to go through these little small collaterals to get back to the heart. That causes lots of back pressure in the leg and venous hypertension. So we can go in and percutaneously put a stent in, open that vein up, and now you've got you know, really good outflow. The pressures go down. Their pain gets better. They can tolerate compression better. And uh, we think that they'll have fewer recurrences over time. So we think that about 50% of patients with venous ulcers, not the 500 pounders, but of those that are candidates for a procedure, you know, we can do something to eliminate their problem. What's the evidence that this is beneficial? I think we really need to close with a look at the ESCAR study. This is probably uh, one of the, the best studies done in the, the, the venous ulcer area. And what they looked at was this was done at the time before we were doing percutaneous ablation. It was with saphenous stripping. So getting rid of the saphenous vein, did it heal more ulcers and did it prevent recurrence? And this was a prospective study, 500 patients, and it was an intent to treat analysis. So in the surgical group, almost 50 patients refused surgery, but they were kept in that group because that was their intent to analysis plan. And they looked at 24-week uh, healing rate and 12-month recurrent rate, and basically no difference in healing. So getting rid of the saphenous if you're doing good compression isn't going to heal more wounds. But look at the recurrence numbers. This is with compression alone at one year, 27% versus 12%. So you can cut in half the recurrence rate by getting rid of that source of hypertension. Why? What happens? Well, the patient goes out and they'll wear a stocking for after they heal, probably for six months or so. Then it comes around to getting a new one because it's worn out and it's another hundred bucks. And they feel fine and they don't have a wound, so they quit wearing the stocking and that's when you start getting your recurrences. And if you follow these out for four years, the benefit remains. This is, like our data, 50% of patients had recurrence and compression alone, and only 27% if you got rid of the saphenous. So any patient that has a leg ulcer that might be due to venous disease and is a candidate for these relatively low-risk uh, uh, procedures ought to be studied, and we ought to consider correcting them if possible. So this is a case study, I think, you know, a uh, pretty typical patient that, that we see in our clinic. A 67-year-old female came to us with this really painful wound. Um, and she had been diagnosed that, that she had had DVT in the past, but she wasn't getting any better because she was having difficulty tolerating compression. And, you know, she was sort of branded as being noncompliant because she'd take off her wraps at home and they weren't getting anywhere. And then the, sort of the reason she got referred is she came in and uh, the wound was sort of spreading. And they said, well, she's got flesh-eating bacteria. We need to get her out of here. So, so we saw her. And just the simple process, you know, I'm, I didn't say, well, this may be arterial, but I just always checked the pulse. And I didn't feel a good pulse. And we got an ABI, and her ABI was 0.7. I mean, it's not terrible, but that makes it hard to tolerate compression. So the other things we found were that she had a lot of drainage. So I think that that stuff was inflamed wound drainage causing the skin irritation around the wound and also part of her, her uh, symptoms. So all we did was we did reduce compression with a lot of padding uh, around the wound. We used very absorptive dressings, changed them twice a week, put her on pentoxifiline. We found MRSA in the wound, which was sensitive to, to uh, you know, sulfa. So we put her on Bactrim and uh, after about, uh, I think about six weeks, this wound cleaned up and really looked, all this stuff was better, and we put an apograph on at that point, and that's where the wound was a few weeks after the apograph. So, you know, get all those factors controlled, and then look at your, how are you going to accelerate the process? You've gotten rid of biofilm and inflammation. You want to close the wound as quick as you can so it doesn't come back. So really, it's multiple modalities and ways to manage the patient that gets you to the end result of more patients healed. So these are my conclusions, and I'll be happy to take any questions that you have. Thank you very much.
I think that there's a microphone coming around, so just shoot your hand up and we'll get that mic to you so everyone can hear the questions. Can you talk more about the data on the stenting? Uh, how long have you been doing that procedure? What's your yes. failure rate over what so, period of time? So as is rampant in the vascular world, the data is always about things like patency, which your patient, they don't care whether it's patent, they don't care if their wound's healed and their leg feels good, but there is good data on pain and swelling. So uh, there's a group out of Mississippi, um, Peter Neglin is the, and uh, uh, Sesh Raju, and if you search them, there's a bunch of articles. And what you find is the stents do well in patients who don't have really extensive obstruction. So about 90% of the stents will stay open in that class. In the ones that have more extensive obstruction, it's about a 70% patency rate out to five years. But there's very good reduction of edema and swelling, and it's really immediate. The patients come back a week or two later when you open up a, a, a really blocked vein, and they say, my leg feels better. Now, we don't have good data on ulcer healing, but we've started registries now to document that. And so hopefully in the next year or two, we'll get much better data on that. There's also now um, two companies that are purpose-building venous stents. These stents we use now are from the arterial system. They may not be the best stent for the venous system. So there's a lot of progress in that, that area. So. Patients with large venous ulcers, which are very painful, that need debridement frequently, do you have any polls as to how would you do those at bedside besides just simply putting topical anesthetics? Yeah, we, so it's a difficult question, and we've tried a lot of different things. So most of them, you know, we use 4% lidocaine, and you can get some of them with that. We set up a, um, a, a minor OR suite adjacent to our wound clinic because I thought, well, we'll give them some conscious sedation, and we'll be able to do them all that way so we don't have to take them to the main OR and go through that whole rigmarole. But if they don't to tolerate it with topical, the conscious sedation, I mean, you pretty much have to put them to sleep almost. And that's not a great thing in a mini, you know, procedure room. So I don't have any good answers. Um, I'd say about 5% of our patients need to go to the OR at some point for good anesthesia and good debridement. What about compression in the face of acute DVT? Uh, so that's a great question. How soon can you compress a leg with an acute DVT? And the data would suggest that it's pretty much immediate. So you're not, uh, there's some studies done by Hugo Parch in uh, Austria that where they, you know, we used to put them in bed. You didn't want them to walk because that, that'll stimulate a PE. And we didn't compress them. And they'd stay in the hospital for a week. Well, think about it now. They come to the ER, we send them home with Lovenox or another injectable, and, you know, they're walking. And the, the, the answer is that you can compress them immediately. So we do it to get rid of the edema. That being said, you know, sometimes you'll get the report from your vascular lab, and it says they have a floating thrombus in the iliac vein, uh, you know. So I, I don't know. I think in those situations we're really actually – for appropriate patients trying to get rid of the thrombus with lytic therapies, but that's a whole other discussion. I'm not sure about the explanation why Apigraph works better uh, on wounds. Uh, uh, venous leg ulcer that's more than one year and uh, works less in uh, ulcer that's less than one year. For anything, if it is less than one year, it should be healthier tissue, and in more than, more than one, one year, it should be more scar down. Well, some of this has to do with clinical trials. So if you design a clinical trial and your, com and your control group heals 70% of the wounds, you're almost never going to find a benefit in your treatment group. So you really want to design a trial that, you know, you're going to have 30, you know, 20, 30% in the control group so you can demonstrate benefit. Um, you know, and there have been other not randomized studies, but looks at more routine patients out in the real world that have, you know, had pretty high healing numbers. But I think that comes down to clinical trial design, really. But, you know, it, it, to me it does mean also that the ones that you're going to 
really want to use it on are those that aren't responding well to compression. I think that's the answer to me. You get the patient healed, they're 350 pounds, they're in a wheelchair, they can't reach their legs. Mm -hmm. How do you prevent recurrence in those patients? They can't get their stockings on, they got no family support, they come yeah. back to the clinic every week. So some definitely. of those patients we've gone to using um, devices that are not elastic compression. So not all of them, but some of them can get on an inelastic device like a Circaid garment. Um, that's particularly good for the arthritic, you know, elderly people that just don't have good hand strength. And I think that's a good strategy, but there's some of them like that, it comes down to their support networks. Do they have family? Are they in a facility that will pay attention to them and do it? But that's one of the reasons that we, we see recurrence, no doubt. If you have any good ideas, let me know. <laughs> when, uh, so, so there's a, a company called Cirque Aid that is now uh, owned by Medi, which is a compression stocking company, and they make a, a good inelastic wrap. Now there, there are other companies out there that do that. I'm just most familiar with them. I have no you know, relationship with them. Uh, but it's a nice uh, device, and we're using more of them now than we used to. When you do culture these wounds, could you comment on your, your technique for culturing? Yeah, it's a good question. And we also reviewed that for the guidelines. And we used to, people used to say, well, you got to do a biopsy. But there's pretty good evidence that if you really do a debridement and then take a swab, you can get an equivalent, very high correlation between that and a biopsy. What I like to do is I, if the wound needs debridement, which it usually does if you're going to culture it, I do my debridement and then I just take a cure it and run it across the, the wound after the debridement and get a sample. The micro guys much prefer a sample rather than a swab. So the other thing is talk to your micro lab director and because it's really nice for them to understand, you know, what you're doing and what you're going to send them. And they're, they're the ones that have to tell you, is this skin flora or is this something that's pathologic? And you have to have those discussions so they can give you useful information. Can you speak to the use of compression uh, with cellulitis? Um, yeah, so cellulitis is another one of those things. What's the treatment of cellulitis? Well, one of the things is getting rid of edema. And so we get consulted by the medical service on cellulitic patients, and they've got them in bed with the leg up, and, you know, there's, why wouldn't you compress them? I mean, it's not going to make their infection worse. It's just going to help resolve the situation quicker. So obviously everybody wants to get the patient out quicker, so I think it's very reasonable to do it. Sometimes a few of them, the leg's so painful they can't tolerate it, so then we go back the next day, and if it's resolved a little bit, then we try and get started on it. Who do you send for evaluation for May Thurner syndrome, and what radiologic studies do you get? And then secondly, what is elevation of the legs, uh, chair recliner versus bed? So the, the first question, if you have a patient, number one, who can't tolerate compression, and, you, you know, you know the kind where you know that they're just, they can't tolerate it. But if they really are trying, I would think about outflow obstruction in that patient. The other one would be, you know, if they're really, we, we found the highest yield of this in patients that have had their wound for a long time. So I think for someone who's got a wound for six months and it's not responding, that's something to consider. So the, there, there are two studies you can do. So if you have a decent vascular lab, they can pick up this by looking at the femoral or iliac veins in some patients. And it's, it's a specific finding. It's not very sensitive. So they won't find every case, but they'll find a lot. And then if you're still suspicious and the, and the ultrasound's negative, then there's a CT venogram strategy you can do. And actually there's a publication that our group did on this with an algorithm. It's in the Journal of Vascular Surgery last year. So if you just search my name on uh, PubMed, it'll come up with, uh, you know, talks about iliocable venous obstruction and venous ulcer patients. And we go through that diagnostic pathway. I was wondering if you could just <clears throat> address how you address uh, nutritional issues and pain in your clinic. Do you have a pain management center that you send people to? Hmm. With 
chronic we try. Penis ulcer disease. Yeah. It takes a takes way too long to get them in our pain management center, so we actually use some private groups around. And um, you know, nutrition assessment is critical. Um, we have we're very closely aligned with our diabetes center, and they have really expert dietary counselors that we can get our patients to see. We don't see it as much in venous ulcer patients as in diabetic and arterial, but yeah, I mean, I think you've got to have that pathway worked out. And for us, we, we know we don't have the expertise. I mean, we know what studies to order, what they want to see, you know, uh, but we just make that process occur by referral. Are you routinely using topical antibiotics for no. when you... No, I don't routinely use them. Um, not that they're not helpful at some times, but I don't know when, and I don't know which ones. So I, I just don't routinely use them. I, actually, I think probably we're going to find more benefit from using them on closed wounds, like surgical incisions and things like that. So we're using silvers on some of our FemPOP incisions, things like that. But for you know routine wounds, I don't use them much. Um, you mean after application? Um, so generally we secure them with steri strips. We put um, a dressing like, I, I personally like Mepitel on top of it. I think it sort of secures it in place. Um, and then we definitely want to have an absorptive layer that's going to wick moisture through so it doesn't sit on the tissue. And that's basically my nurse's favorite foam of the week. So. <laughs> And then, then our compression on top. I like to use multi-layer compression with it. I think it also provides some absorption and it cushions well. So that's the standard thing would be a multi-layer and foam and Mepitel. Uh, some refractory um, venous uh, ulcers are due to incompetent perforators. Uh, there is a need uh, of a very good uh, ultrasound technician to detect them with the patient sitting dangling on the on the bed, and this need to be mapping, uh, do a good mapping before surgery in order to locate them and, and occlude those uh, so, uh, with the soft fascial ligation or other method. And the result is sometimes uh, very very uh, very good in this type right. of patient. So so the, the the idea that we go with is what is that pathway of venous pressure to the wound? So does it come down the saphenous? Does it come through the deep system and up through a perforator? Are there varicosities that go down to the wound? And we want to get rid of that pathway. So it might be perforator, it might be saphenous, it might be varicosities. There's a nice technique to inject the veins around the wound. All of those things we think are beneficial, but we haven't proven that it heals more wounds yet. But actually there's a, a multi-country study that's getting ready to start, sort of the SGAR-2, where we're going to look at that with these techniques. I'm thinking about the long-term effects of removal of the um, saphenous, both the greater and lesser mm -hmm. saphenous. And it seems to me that um, many times this is done, they're not recommended. They say, oh, okay, you don't need compression anymore. <laughs> Um, and I just wonder what's going to happen down the line sure. to so, the deep system. So the only case where we say that we're not sure that you need compression anymore is if you do that and you, we restudy them a month afterwards. If there's no other venous disease and they're, they're, they have no more edema without compression, then compression probably isn't beneficial. What, you know, if you don't have edema, do you need to compress? That's a relative minority of patients who have had a venous ulcer. So the vast majority of them need to continue to have compression. My real you know, issue with most of the people doing these procedures is they don't do that testing to counsel the patient. You know, so if you don't know that there's no other venous disease, why would you tell them they don't need compression? So. You know, it's more, more of a frustration. I get a lot of people coming to me that failed stockings and eventually make their way to me to work on compression. And so they've been given stockings, and unfortunately they were prescribed stockings. You know, they came into the provider's office, they saw edema, they pres prescribed stockings. Mm -hmm. And so I have to reteach the patient that, you know, stockings are not there to reduce your edema. 
it's a short stretch product, so we have to educate them about what that you know, mm-hmm. material is right. and why their TED hose are useless mm-hmm. and why I'm probably going to put them in a circuit instead. Yeah. You know, probably 90% of the guys I get, there's no way they can get a stocking on. And sure, they were but, prescribed at the wrong time. I have to tell them, you know, this is why you have to go through weeks and weeks of wraps with me yeah. to get that edema down. No, I agree entirely. And, but actually, if, if your people that you're getting patients referred from are even doing a stocking, that's better than a lot. How many of you see patients, the treatment's topical, uh, you know, some kind of topical antibiotic and an oral antibiotic, and do that for weeks before they come see you. So, no, I agree. It's, you know, educating them on what compression is, why they need it, why it needs to be consistent. I mean, if they compress it with a stocking for two or three days and then they don't wear it for a day, they've lost all the potential healing of that week. So, um, If you do decide to use compression stockings, what strength do you usually start with and how do you determine that? So that's a, another good question. So if you look, you know, people talk about 30 to 40 millimeters for venous ulcers, but, you know, my goal is to do something that they're going to use and that's going to get rid of their edema. So there was a really nice study um, called the SOX trial. And the SOX trial is in people who've had DVT to try and prevent post-thrombotic syndrome that then leads them on to ulceration. And they had patients in 20 to 30s and 30 to 40s. The compliance rate was much higher with 20 to 30 millimeter stockings. And overall, there was no difference in the outcomes, probably just because you got them some compression more often with 20 to 30. So it's one of those things where you work with your patients. If they'll tolerate 30 to 40, great. If they won't, 20 to 30 is better than nothing. With cellulitis and compression, are you worried about sepsis if you push, push stuff in? No. Not really? I, mean, I, I don't think, I mean, I can't remember seeing that. Um, and again, it's one of the other things the guideline committee has reviewed, and we couldn't find any evidence that that occurs. So, so, so other yeah. than pain, you compress I mean, what's early? the difference between compressing and elevating? You know, you're doing the, it's getting, recruiting that fluid back into the vascular space either way. So if they're being treated with antibiotics for their cellulitis, I think you should be all right. Well, that, yeah, it's a whole different issue, and it's a good question. What do you do with the patient with CHF? They come in, they've got bilateral severe edema and an ulcer, you know? You know, you've got to obviously talk to the cardiologist and say, we're going to do this, we're going to do it a little bit at a time, and hopefully they don't get worse. But don't, yeah, I don't go with high strength on both legs at the same time first day and, and go home and don't sleep well that night, you know. <laughs> Regarding the pentaxophylline, um, what's your criteria for selecting patients, or do they all get it, and then for how long? Are so, you leaving them on it? Yeah. So I, I treat patients who don't already have polypharmacy disease. You know, there are a fair number of interactions, and I don't think it's worth having a problem like that. So that knocks out a lot. But, you know, the patients that are relatively healthy and maybe, you know, are only, only on just a few meds, um, I think it's worth doing as a routine. I mean, you're not going to know if it's beneficial. You just go by the data that in those studies more patients healed. So. I think it's reasonable. And then I, I just treat them if they're tolerating it well till they heal and then stop. If there are um, calcified veins in the ulcer base, how do you help these patients? They have severe pain. Compression is very difficult, but they have extensive venous calcification. Well, that's a good question. Um, true venous calcification is rare. Now, there's calciphylaxis, which is in the subcutaneous tissue. And that's usually in end-stage renal disease patients, and that's a bad actor. Um, And there's not any really good strategies to treat calciflaxis other than compression and, you know, doing the best you can. Now, if they have calcification in the veins, you know, you probably can't remove them. You could inject them if you wanted to to close them down with a sclerosant. Um, But, you know, the other question is going to be where is that? Does it go all the way up the veins? It's really rare to get it in the veins instead of the arteries. I would suggest um, in that trying to get compliance with my patients and also getting cardiology on board 
that using Una boots because it's a rigid dressing as opposed to true compression, mm -hmm. that that has been very helpful so that my patients don't decide to do bathroom surgery when they go home and try to take them off. I have a little bit better success with that if they're just not tolerant to doing compression to begin with. And I didn't know if you had any success with that, going Una boots first instead of a true compression stocking. Well, we haven't done that because Typically when we do an Unaboot, we put some compressive layers on top of it. But if you did it without that, I think that would be a pretty reasonable solution. So the main benefit of that or any other inelastic strategy, though, is going to be supporting the calf muscle pump. Um, so those patients may not be as ambulatory as the ones that don't have that problem. But I think it would be a reasonable thing to consider. The other thing to think about is... If, they, if the wound isn't huge and you can just do a primary on it and then have them do a, something like one of these circade leggings, they take it off at night, they put it on in the morning when hopefully there's less edema and it supports it. So those are some considerations. Hi, I just uh, wanted to ask for your thoughts. I have a 69-year-old patient uh, active uh, with diabetes, peripheral vascular disease, mild, uh, with venous insufficiency, who told me she's had 15 venous ablations 10 years ago, and her leg is swollen as can be, cannot tolerate any stockings, and she's happy with me putting a steroid cream in. And I'm like, I'm not helping you. But uh, do you have any thoughts on that? And uh, my second question is, somebody had told me if a patient has concurrent venous insufficiency and lymphedema to hold off on the venous ablations. Um, well, I think it all comes to good diagnostics in, in both situations. I mean, what's, so particularly if the patient's had previous venous procedures, who knows what the anatomy is? So a good study is the place to start um, because particularly if they've had 15, you said, that, you know, maybe those were injections. A lot of places will bring them back every year, like a spa treatment, and do some more injections. Were they doing anything meaningful? Who knows? So I think good study, I mean, also on the arterial side, so you know exactly what's causing the problem. And then uh, in the second situation, your other question was about, oh, yeah. So, again, it's a, that's a great question because a lot of patients have both. They have components of both. If you can't, if they have real venous reflux, say in the saphenous, you know, it's truly refluxing, it's a big vein, and you close that vein down, it's probably going to make it easier to manage the lymphedema that's left over. So I, I think it's reasonable to treat the venous side and then go about your venous protocol, I mean your lymphatic protocol. But yeah, we see that probably 10 to 20 percent of patients have components of both. We see a bunch of patients with congestive heart failure that comes with amazing amount of edema, and all their veins are dilated, so effectively they have some reflux. And it's a constant battle between the cardiologists and trying to get them to even look at the legs, let alone giving optimum diuretics and control. Right. The, what's your experience in that has been? Um, you know, the... They don't pay much attention to the legs, you're right, and unless they get cellulitis or a wound or something like that. So the preventive side of it is challenging. And, you know, it, it really comes down to communication, and some of them are more receptive than others. But that's all interpersonal, and, you know, it's not any guidelines, really. You just have to do the best you can, I think. I think we all have the same problem there. <laughs> I think probably it would be best for us to wrap up. I'll stay here and be happy to answer any other questions. Thank you all. It's been a great session. I appreciate your attention. <laughs>